Hello and welcome to Brainy Podcast, looking at creativity and innovation, and with a wonderful mix of neuroscience thrown in. So neuroscience that's bringing new answers and direction to how we grow. So I'm Saraya Shaw and my co-partner in crime of creativity is Tracy Fuller. And we connected by our passion for understanding what makes people tick, or as Ruby Wax says, what's going on with our mothership. Hello everyone, we're here for our third session in our series of Talking Creativity and Innovation from a newer perspective, so Brainy Podcast. We're joined today, and we are very, very excited about this, Ross Stevenson. And Ross is the founder and chief learning strategist at Still These Thoughts. He's been helping teams and organizations crack the L&D code for the last two decades with tools, insights, and tactics as a learning and performance specialist. Now, I follow Ross's newsletter, and you can find all these details on our website, and I can highly, highly recommend it because he's also got a really good sense of humor as well. So, Ross, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me in that lovely introduction. I feel like that, you know, we'll have that for my conference speeches in the future. (laughs) I just read this morning, I don't know uh, about you, but I I think Seth Godin is... Godin, the old Martin Godin. Godin, Godin, there you go. And he said today, AI is a mystery. To many, it's a threat. It turns out that understanding a mystery not only makes it feel less like a threat, it Mm. gives the confidence to make it into something better. Yeah, no, I I just didn't agree with that. I don't know for context because I come from the world of corporate learning, corporate education. The game is always about helping people bridge their fear gap. I talk about that a lot with organizations and a lot of that is kind of baseline education in all of this technology and tools and stuff that we use. So yeah, I definitely say Seth's spot on there because that's a lot of what I've been preaching for the last year is I'm not saying to people go out and be artificial intelligence expert, but it's in your best interest just to have a really kind of core understanding of, well, if this is going to impact my working life, which makes up the biggest part of my life, how can I understand what this thing is and how it works and allay much of those fears? You know, there's an old saying that you you fear most what you don't know, right? You always fear the unknown. So if you can understand a bit more about that unknown, I feel anyway, it makes it a bit more, okay, maybe it's not as scary as I thought it was. And then hopefully that conversation to what Seth's alluding to there is, how can I then get involved in shaping that in a positive way. So what are those opportunities then to enhance our human experience and basically live alongside it in work and at play? We have been living with artificial intelligence since about 1956. So that was when kind of the the term artificial intelligence was originally coined at a conference in Dartmouth um, in America. So that was kind of said, right, you know, this is what artificial intelligence means and, and what it can mean for the future. So there's always been subsets of the if you imagine the big artificial intelligence umbrella and there's loads stuff beneath that which i won't go through because it's incredibly detailed and matrix like and people will probably fall asleep going into that but basically what that means is that there's all these different subsets of artificial intelligence now we're used to most of that through streaming services through social media so perfect example of that is you like x post on social media and then that kind of equals the y of we're going to feed you more posts that look like that because you've told our algorithm, this is what you want to look at. So we'll feed you more of that. We also have it on our uh, streaming services from Netflix, Amazon, all of those good things. You watch a film, you rate a film, it goes, oh, okay, this person, you know, they're telling me they want to see more of this content. So the machine then learns to say, oh, okay, I'm going to feed this person more of that content. And of course, you know, that model has come with its opportunities as well and its risks and its downsides over the years. And we're in this era now of generative AI, which is basically, to sum it up, it's allowing you to generate content from basically text, images, content you've already got. So the most popular form of that, and we've come down the niche route of chat GPT from open AI, is effectively this kind of text-based conversation or text-based input where you can say, help me build X, Y, and Z. And then the output of these generative tools is what they do in the tin is to generate some form of content, whether that is a video, whether that is an image, and whether that's text. And of course, that's got people very excited because this is the first consumer-facing tool where people are actually able to go, oh, okay, so I can use this. I can apply this in my work, you know, typical human brain. I can make money off this, or this can make me look smarter. All of those kind of things that 
that people think about. Whereas AI before was very much in the background, kind of people didn't want to get into the nuances of how do these bits of tech work? I think from an opportunity standpoint, what generative AI I would, I hate using the word disruption, but it's only one I can think of right now, where it's kind of disrupting is the norms of how do we create and who can create? So I think a lot of people, and I see this in loads of organizations that I've worked with where some people are in the camp of, creativity is something you're born with versus something that you can actually craft. And some people probably more than nerds like me, just kind of sit in this kind of creativity space where we're always probably building too much stuff. What generative AI is basically doing is saying to anyone, you can be a creator and you can create at scale and you can create at speed. So the opportunity with that is that it's allowing more people potentially. And of course there's, kind of safeguards around this to has one explore more of their creative side because they kind of have this little thing that can plant a seed or help them clarify thinking and work through some of that um, and then two is also forcing people to be creative in many ways because if you imagine we've got on this curve right now where if technology is catching up to do certain tasks to do certain skills the opportunity for people now is those tools are going to allow them to be more creative because it takes away the tasks that are really monotonous that take you away from the ability to, you know, sit in a room for an hour or two and really think deeply about solving a problem versus doing what we all usually do, which is run around like headless chickens, try and figure out a quick fire solution and do that. You know, we're really early in this game, to be honest, like there's a lot of unrealized stuff because these tools are only just about to enter the workforce for the last year. They've pretty much been open and free to people. There's a lot of data concerns around that, but you've now got Google, Microsoft, and open AI who have built enterprise versions of these tools. So we're only actually now going to see, you know, how is, is this going to affect people in the workforce in terms of that, you know, creativity balance. Cause a lot of it right now, to be fair, is a lot of dubious speculation. It's a lot of data. It's a lot of this could happen. I think when anything comes along and it becomes mainstream, there is always the two opposing views coming mm. along. I think uh, I was listening to some historian talking recently that when books were first put into mass production, they talked about the, the loss of the family <laughs> units because people were going to yeah. go off into the world just reading all these, these books. Mm. So probably a very similar revolution about to come through and big change. And mm. um, I'm quite interested, you were talking about how roles can be enhanced how it takes mm. away the task and how it forces people to move into a more creative space mm. with their own thoughts and perhaps mm -hmm. solve some of those bigger problems they're there to do. Have you got any sort of examples or case studies where that's already been done despite it being quite emergent technology? I give you a common one for my industry in L&D where a lot of the teams that I work with are always trying to get better at data analysis and that task in itself is huge and there's many ways that you can break down that task. So what I've been doing with companies is fundamentally introducing this kind of tools versus task for AI framework where what we do is discuss as a group, what are the, the tasks in that kind of overarching big objective that you need to do? Um, and then looking at those tasks, what are the tasks that we can automate? So automate being what can we leave to technology to basically do for us so we don't have to put any human input in there? What are the tasks that we can collaborate with AI tools on? So fundamentally, how can we augment AI and humans together? And then the last bit is what is the uniquely human task in that? So that's really the more the creative bit where Technology can't help. The human needs to kind of go in. It needs to do that. So an example in that situation would be if we had a bunch of learning data and we needed to synthesize all of the data in the organization for a end of year report, as an example, and present that to a leadership team, which is quite a common thing for LND teams. So what they could automate in that process is the data collection from the organization. It's very simple to get a tool to amass all of the data from the different points. And you know that takes away about 20, 30% of the work for an individual to do, because what they'd have to do is they'd have to individually go into different systems, pull off loads of reports and amalgamate that all together. But you can automate that, which is great. 
And in working with AI, what they'd be able to do is then say, okay, if I work with sort of a chat GPT, I can take all that data and I can work with chat GPT as a thinking partner to then look at what are the five biggest trends that are in this data. Now you can do that from a human standpoint. That takes a long time though. You're probably going to spend about a week, maybe more looking over that. What you can do with chat GPT is basically say, this is everything I've got. Give me the key themes. So give me the overarching themes. There may be like 50 or 60 of those, but then synthesize that into what are the five things that I would need to know in X organization with X many people and we're trying to achieve Y results. And what ChatGPT can do is then unearth those insights for you. And then what you're able to do as a human in that collaboration piece is then A, sense check that, and then expand upon those ideas to look at based on what we've unearthed there, is there anything else I might want to consider? And then you can work with that tool to look at, is there any correlations that would be interesting to unearth? So you've gone through your two stages there of automating with AI and then augmenting with it. And then the last stage is saying, you now need to go present all of these insights and then the actions out of those insights to your C-suite team. Now you would do that as a human. So you would be the one that has to then use the human skills of how do I go and create a story around this to engage my C-suite team? And then how do I go and present that? So that's very much the human element of it. So that's just kind of a very, I'd say a simple example of taking common tasks that people do and then breaking it down to see, can generative AI tools help us? When I'm doing a work with a lot of organizations, we're not really having conversations on replacing roles or replacing skills. And that it's really looking at how can we just enhance the tasks that people are doing? So a big win for many organizations that I work with is saying, how can we give your people back 20% of time over the next 12 months? And that's a huge win for them because they want to do that. And then they want people to focus on bigger solutions. All this week, I've had about three or four coaching sessions with very senior people in organizations. And most of them are actually working at night because that's the only time they have to think. Mm. They're so in the doing and the task for everybody else. And when I mentioned this, this the thought they all just got so excited because what they want to do is to be able to think and to create because to your earlier point, that's why they went into industry mm. to do what they did. But what one thing that I just wanted to pick up on there, when the AI thing can actually collate the data and go through it and find mm-hmm. the trends, is there also an advantage there because it's not going to be biased? Because people do have a natural bias when they're mm. going through data. And what's that saying? You can interrogate the data to do anything you want it to do. Mm-hmm. Whereas actually something that doesn't have those kind of biases mm. is, is going to kind of complement the human abilities and skills far more. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a hard question to answer, though, because these tools inherently, they are biased from a standpoint. If they're looking at public data, which a lot of them are, they are biased because essentially what they're doing is reading all the world's data, and then they don't have that bias detection and handling feature that kind of, you know, we hope we do as humans to then filter through, well, does that make sense? I mean, in this specific example, it's hard to tell from my experimentation, to be fair, because yes, you are inputting your own data. So in that example, I would be giving data from a a small organization and working with that. So I would think, but I can never 100% know on that it wouldn't have any ulterior motive or bias because i've given it the specific set of data and all it's really doing is reading that data so i would like to say no it's not biased but my honest answer is i don't 100 percent know which is always why when i'm doing anything with it i always put that human lens so whatever it says to me um I, i've done this today i will then go in and take a look at a report at the pages i'll say tell me the pages where you found this tell me the data what specifically says this and then i can go in as the human and do a five minute sense check and just go okay you know that's good that's fine i really like the way that you've introduced the different stages of how to utilize it as well and i'm interested Mm. in the collaboration because that leans me in probably to soraya at this stage around the human brain we can't Mm. rule out what's going on in our own brain so what are we bringing to the party that ai can't i think it's really uh, obviously it's interesting otherwise we wouldn't be here (laughs) uh, (laughs) we think it's interesting if everyone else does (laughs) because our brains are so complex you know let's face it they're they're learning new things every single day about the brain we really don't understand it all and we probably never will 
But what we do know is that it's always making connections. So when we're talking about creativity and innovation, we know that people need to have a sort of brief or a, a question to ask to work towards, and your brain will go off and make those those connections. So, you know, we were talking about it um, before. AI can't have that complexity of understanding the emotions and our behaviors and how we actually kind of live our lives that our brain knows and that we know subconsciously as well. And I think that's where the biases are quite interesting because we are biased as as, um, humans because that's how we survive essentially at the end of the day. But it's actually our individuality and our connections that we make and how the brain creates its own pictures and has its own perceptions and its own expectations of things, which for me is very different from an AI system. And to your point, Ross, it's what it's giving us back. I think we've become so task focused and everything is urgent, 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 do, 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 don't think or create. But actually we know that's got to be our future. That's, you know, we're mm-hmm. in the fifth revolution, things have really changed. And that's where we have that brain advantage. So if people can get rid of all the the do and actually start the thinking and using our tool, which mm. is, is far superior, then I think that's that's fantastic. That's what we need. So the human brain is picking up on some of the nuances and the things that are built up out of wisdom and experience. Definitely, yeah. I've started noticing how generic a lot of writing has become. And my Mm. instincts immediately go off and say, that's not human. That's been done by AI. And that's what I think, again, is quite interesting about our our brains and how we operate because of theory of mind and that we're always trying to understand what somebody else is thinking and what they're Mm. going to do. I think instinctively sometimes you read something and it jars with you because it doesn't feel real. And Mm. I think there's a lot of generic writing and ways of using it at the moment that mm. our brains are, I imagine, will become more and more alert to. Yeah, I would agree. And I think we're even starting to see that now. I think one of the reasons why people gravitate more to the things that I write about is because I'm just writing it as I talk. Like I don't I don't edit it to sound like a search engine optimized post. I'm not putting keywords in. I am just writing from whatever comes out of my head after I've had too much tea and then I'll edit it down to make it a bit more PG than it was in the first draft. But what I notice is a lot more connection recently from people with that because they're like, oh, I feel like that. Oh, I definitely get that. I think it's because my writing is very, very feeling based. And we can all start to see them, right? The AI generated stuff. And, you know, we're the masters of our own demise here because it's trained on things we've written before in this template format. It's just kind of pushing that back out. Now, obviously, that is great if you are a small startup or product focused organization that's literally just putting out real cookie cutter stuff on a blog that says seven ways to do this or how to do that. But if you're in the business of, let's say, creative writing, um, you know, deep analytical thinking and trying to make it more human than it's not. And I think, again, this is dubious speculation, but I think that type of writing and thinking will be more prized over the next few years because I think we're going to get a slew of all of this stuff that's AI generated. And then what people are going to go is, well, actually 80% of that I don't want to look at because I know, you know it's all come from the same source. But then what they will do, hopefully, is then gravitate towards people who are really focusing on that kind of, and the only way I can describe it, it's like, it's like a proper artist right now, but it's like creating art. It's like sitting there and saying, you know, how do I create something that really, you know, capturing the essence of whether it's humanity, whether it's emotion, whether it's connecting with other people that those tools aren't going to bring together. But look, AI is still going to sell for those kind of companies who are doing the very basic stuff. But I think the people who hopefully anyway, and it's weird in this society to stay with the, influencer movement and all this but i think that hopefully the people that we gravitate towards to more are the independent thinkers it's about teaching people about the brain and how their brain works because mm. you talk about the gaming theory and that's all the the neurochemicals dopamine oh, yeah. you know reward system fear you know your amygdala goes off all all of the those networks that actually mm. exist in mm. our brain and i think when you can start helping people to understand how they can break habits how you know neuroplasticity works in the brain and how things become like the Grand Canyon get deeper, mm. and deeper and deeper. People then have a choice and people have a power back. 
So for me, there's yeah. a big part of that, which is part of our inherently our creativity, our innovation, the way that we think, the control that we have over our lives. And for me, that's a very important part because behavioral science and nudge theory and mm. all those types of things are going in the right direction. But it's becoming big tech again, actually, all the brain stuff. But actually teaching people, what you know, especially kids, this is what's oh, yeah. happening. I agree with that because, look, you know, I've worked in tech companies where we have had people who are, you know, psychological experts in getting yeah. people's attention who are – I've been with people from Brown and Yale and Harvard who are far, you know, more intelligent than I. And I've been around these people and, you know, they're talking about ways to, how do we engage more users? You know, how do we do that? What, what words can we use? And, you know, they're working with experts. So you haven't really got a fighting chance if you're, you know, some poor 13 year old child who's going on these algorithms and you are fighting against world-class, well-paid teams that are building these algorithms to say, we know how to influence your brain. We know what you know gets your attention. It's, it's why in the news, right? I say I don't want, I don't read anything on news channels these days because you go on there and it's just a litany of attention grabbing headlines and stuff that's turned into very not always negative, but it's turned into very kind of gossipy type stuff because that's you know the human brain wants to know about that it's like oh i want to survive what's this about i'm going to lose exactly. yeah. a thousand pound on this so I'll, I'll go look at it but unfortunately that is the status quo and i think you know not many people were educated on that i know about this now because i've spent too much time in tech companies and with marketing teams and these are these are people who are pros like I say, who are working with universities, who are working with big companies on specifically attracting users, gamifying experiences. Unfortunately, I'm one of those people now that's just too aware of it. So I, I even know when I'm doing it myself, I can, when I'm on a social media platform, and I must say I only use one nowadays because I kind of want to disconnect from them. I'm aware when I'm doom scrolling. I'm very aware, you know, when I'm sitting there and just, you know, okay, I'm just going to keep scrolling, keep going through it. And I sit there and go, why am I doing this? Like, how is this helping me? You know, it says my partner all the time. I'm saying to her, you know, I just, I get enraged sometimes at nothing. It's got nothing to do with me. And there's some random thing. Oh, God, that really annoys me. And then it would just set me off for the next kind of few hours. But they know. But I know they know. And it really annoys me because I know enough about it to be like, why did you let that yeah. you know, kind of get you so angry? But um, I mean, that, that's the thing, isn't it? In this attention economy, you know, knowing how your brain works is just incredibly powerful. And people are weaponizing it, really, at companies. You know, they won't like that in that saying. But I mean, there's many things out there. They're not hiding it. They are recruiting people who are specialists in these fields to effectively weaponize that for, you know, financial gain that lets them control all of the stuff that you're looking at. There's no by chance that you came across a video on YouTube for this reason. There's a lot of algorithms in the background that says, here's what's X, Y, and Z happening. What's hot right now? How does this connect with this? And that's why you've seen that but um i can't remember the documentary but there's a, a really good one on netflix with a bunch of people who were heads of these big tech companies and a foundation that's called i think it's called tech for good and they did a whole two-hour documentary on how this all works in tech companies over the last few years and they were interviewing the original people who built the models and how it all eventually got out of control from a monetization purpose and it was really interesting in there that they were saying that all of the heads of these companies do not let their children have access to mobile phones and social platforms because they know they know what they're doing pretty much they're kind of selling i say it sometimes i kind of like that's selling digital heroin they're basically just pushing people to go and do this stuff and engage with it but yeah my point being some is like to many people or to society in general when we're looking at this technology is don't let it go the same way don't let it become the steroid that then pushes social media to the next level of AI influenced social media. And I'll finish this a really interesting case study now already where on Instagram, someone has created a female AI model that looks human and it's got like 3 million followers on Instagram. She's not real at all, but they've got all these pictures, what they've created using AI, doing these kind of fake stories. And yeah, there's young kids following this and you can see already there's tools there for influencing disinformation and it's all being used for you know this model fake model i should say is, is getting brand deals of companies and being adverts so again there's all this bit about you know what are we going to do with this technology are we just now going to keep using it to influence us even more and then try and control that but yeah i agree with you i think it'd be great if we could get more 
understanding, just a baseline understanding of how do you feel this way? Why do you feel this way? Why do we interact with this stuff and the tools and tactics that are being used on you? Because I always say, once you know about it, you just can't not see it. And I'm one of those terrible people pointing out to my partner all the time. Look at this, look at that. Look what they're doing there. Or when you go look at a a wine menu or something, it's all programmed in a way to influence you to take an action. Yeah. I remember going to my first restaurant where they bought the wine menu Mm. on, on an iPad and that felt amazing. And now that's fairly commonplace that you, well, you can order from your own phone, let's be fair, mm. in a lot of restaurants now. I'm just wondering, you know, because technology is moving so far and we don't quite know where this is going to go and how it's going to settle into organizations and places of work, there are going to be jobs that are at risk. Mm. There are going to be people that, for example, they haven't yet caught up with what we're terming as old technology, like good old Excel or Mm. Word, Mm. and they still don't know how to utilize that. And Mm. yet we're moving on to things that are integrated operations like AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's the ultimate question, isn't it? It's, It's like, I mean, the honest answer is I don't know. Like, I think we're still figuring this all Come out. Come on, Ross, you must have an idea. Please, please. How do we, <laughs> how do we increase, this, increase this creativity and innovation that we need? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of research. Look, I'll share something with you that came from, and I'm building a kind of bigger, let's call it thesis on this at the moment, which I'm going to release in the, the next month when I'm kind of workshopping at companies. But there's data at the moment where I'm looking across at the correlation of a lot of these reports, which are saying, which are going to be the big skills in the AI age? And the three that keep coming up are adaptability. So, you know, being able to context switch, it's got a bit to do with tech, taking on tech, analytical judgment, looking at creative evaluation as well, and creativity itself. Those have been the main three. I would say the supporting ones around that have been intellectual curiosity, emotional intelligence, of course, bias detection, and handling that bias as well. And then we can call it the kind of last piece of that is what we look at as AI delegation. So I've got, I'll send you this image as well after our conversation. So you can include it in your show notes, but Microsoft had this very powerful visual of the human brain and they broke that down into seven different sections of all of those kind of skills that I just mentioned. And what they've given each of those a percentage in the brain to say, you know, what should you focus on to really help you evolve and stand out in the kind of AI age. And of course, you know, AI delegation and working with AI is part of that is about 20% of it. But the other 80% was actually leaning all into our most human skills, which is all around, you know, how do we think analytically? How do we have that curiosity? How do we, you know, be creative, looking at emotional intelligence? So I think what's really clear for me in a lot of these studies is that the future is most definitely human. So because so much more tech is always coming in and um, it was weird, actually, I got it on my shelf, but I was reading a book from Sir Ken Robinson called Out of Our Minds. And he had a whole list in there over the last 70 years of all of the technological innovations that have happened at pace. And again, what's been born out of that is that we just get closer and closer to core human skills. I think my note on that would be as someone who's worked in the kind of corporate industry for 15 years on these talent development pieces is that what I've seen is the difference between people who get to senior exec levels and people that don't are their human skills because technical skills get you so far, right? People who are great technically in their domain, but they're the worst leaders possible. And they, you know, they shouldn't be leading people. And that's fine because they're great as a technical person and very competent there. But the common trait I see of everyone at the very, very top is they have very good human skills. And I think that is what we're seeing more of now is that if generative AI tools and more tools are going to take away tasks for us and part of that work, it then relies on the human to become way more in touch with those things of how we've survived for thousands of years and then amplifying that um, in the workplace. That's not to say you need to be amazing at all of them, but you know if you can be the best damn storyteller possible with a bucket load of emotional intelligence and creativity, you're going to go far Mm. in this kind of age, because those are things that technology can't replace. And 
it, it brings, you know, it brings people in and people might call out different things like charisma or charm or, or whatever that is, but they're all, you know, uniquely human bits. And it's funny because I've been watching a documentary about the car maker, John DeLorean. I don't know if you remember yeah, him and he had yeah. DeLorean motor car and, you know, he got himself in trouble eventually. But the biggest thing people always said about him was that, oh, he was so charismatic. Oh, he was so intelligent. You know, he was very deep thinking. Those aren't traits that we give to technology and him as an individual was able to you know buy in so many people to this vision even though there was trouble underneath it purely based on his human capacity to connect so i think the answer to that question is you know it's very much a human future and it's very much you know focusing on all those things that i think companies call soft skills but i hate that word um but are very much the the human skills and what i'm saying to companies right now is that you know double down on those things and what i'm saying to individuals again is double down on those things too because we take the examples you were just speaking about with excel and really now ai tools can fundamentally run excel for you so you can kind of even forget having to think about how to use excel i was just about to say thank you they'll they'll do it for you right (laughs) but then what that enables you to do and this is where from a skill standpoint I'm really trying to do work and encouraging people is that they need to step up their game around the creativity around building solutions. And they need to step up the game around how can I think more, you know, not just critically, but analytically and have context to that as well. Cause it's very easy to get tools to do stuff for you, but it's very different to sit there and go, how does this apply to my organization How do I connect this with other humans? So, you know, the world is going to work well for those people. And I think, again, that we've seen studies already. There's one from the Niles, I think it's Niles Nielsen group that I was looking at recently where they did, a, I think it was about six months worth of case studies with ChatGPT. And what they saw across the board was a 66% increase in productivity. And how they measure that productivity was looking at tasks that people were able to do at speed and at high quality outputs. And one of the most interesting things from that was that they found that the workers who were classed as lower skill workers got the most out of generative AI tools because what it was allowing them to do was basically take on the really kind of mundane things that they're doing as part of their role and it allowed them to reskill. It allowed them to go acquire more skills and become a more competent professional to allow them to have more control of their career in the job market. So again, I think that for me It's early days, but it's a really promising sign because if we're able to say to people that may not have always had the access to all of the great education that they wanted to or the opportunities and say, how can we automate some of this job to make it easier for you? But then the key thing for me is helping them upskill. And I think that's the bit we need to focus on is how do we help them upskill to be human? So yeah, I mean, the future for me is definitely human. I'm not expecting, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or any Terminators to turn up anytime soon. I think it's really just focusing on what makes you human, double down on it, maximize it. You'll do well, I think. Oh, what a lovely way to end. That's (laughs) fantastic. The future is most definitely human. If you want to know more about what's going on with Brainy Podcasts, packed with how-tos and general resources, go to our website, brainycast.com.